today I am on 100 and tomorrow I start from zero. Still remember the day when I first wore my Indian jersey and when you are passionate about something you will always start working towards it. While my passion for the game makes me give my best day in and day out, I like giving my best to the things I'm passionate about, which is the best engine oil for my car. So remember the day when I first wore my Indian jersey. And when you are passionate about something, you will always start working towards it. While my passion for the game makes me give my best day in and day out, I like giving my best to the things I'm passionate about, which is the best engine oil for my car. So still remember the day when I first wore my Indian jersey. And when you are passionate about something, you will always start working towards it. While my passion for the game makes me give my best day in and day out, I like giving my best to the things I am passionate about, which is the best engine oil for my car. So, Futura G Plus. Thankful Karna. अरे भाई साहब लुब्रिकेंट मिलेगा जी बिल्कुल मिलेगा Equipped with his five senses, a man explores the universe. He calls this adventure science. Good evening, everyone. This is Shomona Bhumi on behalf of Jadavpur University Science Club, present here to host the third chapter of Stroke of Insight. Jadavpur University Science Club, as the name suggests, is a science-oriented club whose main aim is to explore the new horizons of science. And if you all want to be scientifically enriched, then do follow our Facebook page, which goes by the name Jadavpur University Science Club. You can fo also follow us on our Instagram handle. Next, we would like to welcome our very talented alumni, Ishita Paldi. She has pursued her BSc Honours in Geological Sciences from JU. 
Her MSc is from IIT Bombay. She is a former graduate research assistant at Scripps University of Ocean Science and currently a graduate research assistant at University of Louisiana at Lafayette in cosmochemistry and astrophysics. Hello, Di. Hello. How are you? Hello, I'm very well. Thank you. And okay. thank you, everyone. Thank you, Shrona, especially for taking mm -hmm. care of me all this time. Mm -hmm. And to the entire JUSC team, um, you guys are doing an amazing work. And to okay. everyone that's listening. <laughs> thank you so much, Didi. So, Didi, can you just give us a description of the field of research where you are working? Yes, I would love to do that. Um, okay. If you want me to talk about my research, I would like to share my screen. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. So, hello, everyone. Just to start with my, as Shruman already mentioned, I am a graduate uh, assistant or so i'm pursuing my phd at the university of louisiana lafayette so i'm working with dr manav yadav my field of study is laboratory astrophysics and cosmochemistry so i study stardust and planets i am originally from a geology background and with time it's almost a decade now uh, which time I have trajected myself and moved into the astrophysics uh, cosmochemistry business. Uh, so let me give you a brief about what I'm working on. Starting with how the solar system came to be. So this is a general theory and I will explain it in a very brief. So around 4.6 billion years ago, there was this big uh, cluster of dust and gas uh, hanging around where our solar system is right now. And then it eventually started to collapse onto each other, probably because of a supernova or any kind of perturbations around. Either one supernova or multiple supernovas, we do not know yet. So it started collapsing onto each other. Eventually, almost all of it, or more than 99% of it collapsed to the center due to gravity and formed the sun. The remaining part, if you can see my cursor here, the remaining part uh, stuck with each other, impacted, joined with each other, and eventually formed bigger and bigger planetary objects, which, which today are the planets, the satellites, and all the asteroids. So this is a general theory of how the solar system formed. Now, um, what my research is, so I look into pre-solar grains. What are pre-solar grains? I'll explain in a bit. So remember from the last slide, there is this big um, cluster of gas and dust, right? So this is called protosolar nebula. So this is this yellow patch here. Now this gas and dust or anything in the universe comes from where? They have to originate somewhere, right? So all the particles from at the center of stars and eventually the stars die and they eject things out. Uh, and that gives materials, supplies the materials to form different objects in the solar system or even in other parts of the universe as well. So this is a formation of the solar system. Now, some of the particles from the dust. Uh, so another thing is every star has its signature materials. So they have their own types of materials. They have their different chemical isotopic compositions. So seeing a particle, you can say, OK, this comes from this star. This comes from this star. So when a solar system forms, it goes through different kinds of thermal uh, alterations. And at those times when it's going undergoing alterations, the particles lose their parent signatures. Because as we know, the isotopic clock resets, things form a new thing, two different things join and forms a new thing. So it loses its isotopic signatures. Um, 
to relate to its parent star. But some of the particles escapes this um, uh, total alteration thing. So these particles are called pre-solar grains. Pre-solar name suggests that it was beyond the solar uh, system time. So it comes from before solar. Now, some of the particles, uh, even in today world, they are just floating around in the space. So they're called interplanetary dust particles. So they're just floating around. So what um, the space agencies do is they send out um, missions, uh, spacecraft with sticky wings, okay? It's like cellotapes. Uh, we have done this as a kid. So we put out cellotapes out in, outside the window and a lot of dust sticks around. So it's similar to that. So they put out, uh, so Stardust missions go out and collect dust and comes back and we uh, analyze that to find pre-solar grains. Another way is some of the materials are incorporated in the rocks that today oh, we have like the planets or the satellites or the asteroids. So they are inside the rocks, but they have somehow uh, escape the thermal alterations. Now, there is this beautiful system called meteorites, not a system, but an object. So meteorites are what? It's our free um, field uh, sample delivery system. So our field is space, right? So most of us cannot go to space. It's only a few people who have ever gone into space. So for in order to get samples from space, we either have to send uh, missions like OSIRIS-REx, where they go sit on a planet, drill it, burst it, get the samples out, or uh, we can wait for the nature to do its course and it brings some of the samples, meteorites falls on the surface, and we go and hunt them, we get them, dissolve it, um, take out its particles, break it down, and then analyze it. So we analyze the star grains, and what we are trying to find is it's, uh, uh, what's called, uh, it's a link to the um, parent stars. Now, why we want to know where it came from? This would help us understand where um, solar system formed. So solar system is inside a galaxy, right? And the galaxy has many stars. Now, there is a theory that the sun uh, has moved in the galaxy. So it is not where it's, I do not know what astrophysical um, studies they have done, like the details of it. But so what, what happens is the sun where it is now is not where it is supposed to be. It has moved in its position in the solar system and in the galaxy. So we are using our um, study of the pre-solar grains and its origin with the stars, we might be able to better constrain where it was originally. Additionally, uh, knowing what stars it came from and what kind of materials that a star has, it would also help us um, improve our astronomical uh, observations. So in astronomical observations, we generally measure um, chemical compositions of the stars. And knowing what chemistries actually the materials have would help us make better spectroscopic observations. So these are like broader motivations to what we are doing, but in general, it's cool, I think, to, un to know where and where our existence comes from. It's amazing. I didn't know that things uh, form inside stars like i knew it but i didn't know it like that but it's like woo, we are all stardust like it's a saying right we are all stardust we literally are all stardust okay so this is my main thesis now what's my it's like a side project that i'm doing um but okay so moon formation so how did moon form so there's this around 3.8 billion years ago from today, there's this earth. The earth didn't look like this at that time. Like it's pretty ugly. It's probably like the right side pictures. And it was chilling and trying to form itself. Now, a um, now another object, Theia, we call it Theia, 
um, it's a hypothesis, okay? How moon formed? There might be other hypotheses out there as well, but this is the most accepted hypothesis. So the moon came, uh, uh, object came, struck the earth, which created a lot of debris and which eventually formed the moon. So a big object comes, impacts, makes a lot of debris, melts half of the planets, um, and then eventually forms the moon. So this is what how moon forms. So during that earlier solar system time, when things were forming, there was a lot of impact. As you can imagine, there are a lot of particles. They are super violent, moving at a very high speed, colliding with each other. So everything was always colliding with each other and making impacts, making it a violent. You wouldn't want to be around that place. No one wants to be around that place. So we are, are more stable and that's how why and how life evolved because now things come down, we are more stable, things can go on a more larger time scale. Now, as you understand uh, from this uh, diagram that um, object there is with a core. So core generally has high density materials like iron and nickel. So um, eventually the materials that is colliding in a planet, they differentiate and the higher density ones sinks to the center of the material of the planet. And that's how it differentiates. This is how our Earth in today's look like too. It has a core and it has a mantle and it also has a crust. But this is not our Earth. It's proto-Earth. So it's around three to four billion years ago. Now this has, if impacts comes and falls to a planet, what happens is it, due to that huge energy, it would melt certain part of itself and as well as the surrounding planet like where it's impacted right and that melt or that amount of energy would help create differentiation so as you can see in different lights uh, on different uh, colors the differentiation is happening again so it's melting certain parts of itself and its surroundings and the heavier things are sinking down so this has effect on how our earth looks like today and also, apart from the sizes and the, ang uh, the sizes and the density of the impactors, one more thing affects the impacting energy. Um, as recently found out by Nakajima at all, 2020, that the angle of impact, so whether it's um, attacking, whether the impact is um, like horizontally, like in the equator, or whether it's uh, from the pole or from anywhere around the amount of energy that a earth has to uh, or, or any planet has to endure internally depends on that as you can see like um, different angles so the lighter the shape the higher the energy so if it's striking from here the energy distribution is different but if it's striking from here the energy distribution is different so this i found is interesting because uh, depending on where it's striking, it's either going into the internal energy or helping it move its uh, momentum. It's giving a different uh, direction. Now, I am trying to understand or find out how, how it has, how things have happened with Earth. So trying to understand how many impactors Earth would have had or how much energy I would have to endure so that its differentiation can be inferred back to today. Uh, I can go into it later if you have questions about it, but that's brief about what I'm trying to do as a side project. Now, I have another thing that I'm trying to find out out of my curiosity. It's not related to any of my theses or anything, but it's just something that just came too big uh, because my mother asked a question sometime two years ago and then I got me intrigued and I started looking into it. Okay, 
So this is a picture. It's completely unrelated, but I just wanted to show up. This is a picture at Boulder, Colorado, and I found that it's a very nice picture. So in in so in the city of Boulder, Colorado, it's a very pretty place. And uh, in their zebra crossings are painted with bright colors, and it's such a like colorful and happy place in my mind. So, yeah, um, this is just a show of you guys. Uh, okay, moving on. So also, another thing is I'm trying something new. I'm interested in science communication, so I'm trying something new. This is a thing called sketch your science. So the future, uh, like the upcoming slides you're gonna see are my own sketches. And uh, so I'm trying to see if that makes uh, uh, communications more fun. So this is an experiment and you guys are part of it. So I would welcome any um, feedback on this, okay. Now, so every year, I know it's comical, but stay with me here. Uh, so every year, thousands of people die out of lightning, okay? So the motivation of this project, as I said, um, two years back when I was back in my home, um, there, was a, there were a lot of thunderstorms, and we were getting many news of people dying due to lightning. And my mother suddenly posed this question about whether the number of the frequency of thun thunderstorm and lightning has increased over time because according to her she has been hearing more news recently than what she had been hearing previously now we have to keep in mind that nowadays more there is more source of news there's more reporting so that is a bias so it's like maybe it's like that but then Next day, I saw a newspaper article, and there are actually studies that show that number of lightning, the frequency of lightning has gone up over the last few decades. So this was my motivation. Now we have to first understand, in order to get into it, it's like my idea was like, why is it going up? And if, if, if any, so I... So first of all, I had no idea how clouds form, what lightning is, like still bizarre to me, like what lightning is. And like, it's completely a different domain. It's like meteorology. So I tried looking it up, did my self-study. So how, uh, I'll go in a very briefly how things are happening up in the sky. So when a cloud is composed of various particles of, uh, water particles uh, and so all these droplets of water they go in a in a thunder cloud which is more so probably the stratocumulus clouds there is a lot of convection that goes on inside a cloud because there is a temperature uh, gradient there so now as they are going through this um, uh, convection they go past each other, the particles go past each other and they strip electrons from each other. Now, as you know, the heavier particles, which has its electrons stripped, uh, not stripped, they sink down, but the particles that are getting stripped, the electrons are getting stripped, they become lighter and goes to the top. So there is a charge separation that happens. So the negative droplets, they are on the bottom, the uh, positive one, they are on the top. Now, uh, as this cycle goes on, there's a charge separation. But eventually, the charge separation also affects the ground. And there is a charge that goes up near the ground, and they discharge through lightning. So this is the general way, the very crude way of describing how lightning happens. Uh, so I was saying there is a cloud, there is charge separation, and the charge separation, the charge is discharged using a lightning. That's the basic. Now, all these particles I showed, they are wrapped around. So all uh, droplets, they are wrapped around uh, any object. There generally needs a condensation nuclei. So most times it is uh, any any kind of dust, and in urban environment, it's mostly a uh, like a polluting matter. It's called a particulate matter. Particulate matter need not always be polluting, but in urban places, mostly it's 
it's a uh, um, sulfur dioxide or uh, NOx or things like that. Now it's very um, predominant. Particulate matters are very predominant in urban environment, as you can uh, like understand um, from car exhaust, from chimneys, from factories exhaust. There are so many sources of pollutions in uh, in an urban environment. Now studies have seen that the more the number of particulate matter, the higher there is a lightning. There's a straight correlation. Uh, such studies has been done in many parts of the world, in India, many parts of India, um, in China, in Taiwan, um, in Europe, there is in South America, as well as in North America. So everywhere there is, people have found there is a big correlation between PM and lightning. Now it is it is to be said that correlation does not mean causation, but according to meteorologists, uh, in this case it is a causation, because more the number of particles, more will be the number of droplets, more will be the charge separation, then um, higher uh, in strength and in frequency, more will be the lightning. Now. Once uh, uh, lightning happens, what happens in the atmosphere? So this goes into the domain of atmospheric chemistry. And last semester, I did take atmospheric chemistry class. And all these things I learned from that class. Um, yeah, I still take classes and I still give exams. Yes, it's, it has not ended yet. So when happen, what happens is when nitrogen, when uh, the nitrogen and oxygen in the atmosphere, because of this lightning, uh, combines and forms nitrogen oxides. Now, this nitrogen oxide then eventually dissociates because it's an unstable form. So it gives out uh, oxygen and with that oxygen atom goes and combines with another oxygen molecule and forms an ozone. Now ozone, as we know, is good for us because it protects us from the UV radiation, right? Now that is good for us, ozone is good for us, but when it stays, stays up in the stratosphere, you stay up, do your thing, but actually if it's in the troposphere, troposphere means the um, first 10 to 15 kilometers in the atmosphere from the ground. So it's the air we breathe in, it's the place we live, right? So in the troposphere, ozone is not good. So here it's a bad ozone because it forms formaldehyde. It's also toxic to human beings. In, in. So it causes a lot of health problems. Now, apart from health problems, ozone also combines with the hydrocarbons in the atmosphere. So from the car exhaust, even plants give out hydrocarbons. From all the un, unburnt or partially burned fossil fuels, Ozone reacts with all of them and forms secondary particulate matter, which are smaller in sizes and are equally toxic. So now, if you remember, more the particulate matter, more is the lightning, right? So this brings to the question. So more the particulate matter, more the lightning, more the lightning, more ozone is being created, and this ozone is creating more particulate matter. So the question is whether there is a positive feedback loop that's happening, and whether we as human beings are a big contributor to one of the elements in this positive feedback loop. So that's the question. I do not know how to answer this question. I'm still looking for people to help me to answer this question. But yeah, here it is. So these are the three major things that I'm working on. And so that's it. I will stop sharing now. Thank you for listening. OK. If you have any questions for me, I didn't say anything about myself, but I guess so I'll Thank you so much, Didi. It was really very informative, and especially the sketches. It actually made science fun. So some questions are obviously coming. Um, so the first question is uh, asked by Shorin Khan, your thoughts on Oumuamua, like the comet? Thoughts Oumuamua. on it? I do not know a lot about Oumuamua, to be honest. I don't think I can comment on that. OK. So the next question by Blue Orion is, 
why the asteroid belt is only formed between Mars and Jupiter? Okay, that goes into huge astrophysics domain. There is a lot of astrophysical questions. Guys, I am not an astrophysicist. I'm a geologist. I'm trying to... This is my second year in learning astrophysics. So it, it, why it is, it has... There are many theories on that. So uh, they say that there was a planetary body there between Mars and Jupiter, which eventually disintegrated and formed that asteroid belt. Also, because of, um, so Jupiter is, uh, the asteroids there might also be because of Jupiter. Jupiter is the biggest planet in the solar system, and it has a huge amount of gravity, so it attracts all the debris around itself. Um, also, the asteroid marks the, it's called, um, what's it called? It's, a, it's called a snow line. So it demarcates an area where the uh, things that's coming in uh, uh, from the outer, outer solar system, it comes in. And uh, that's where it accumulates. But also things from the inner solar system are continuously being pushed out. And it goes and accumulates there. So there are various theories. So these are the few that top of my head. Okay, thank you so much. Now the next question is by Rahul Shah. He is asking, what is the difference between core and protocore? Protocore, proto means um, nascent stage, like previous stage. So today's core is, so the diagram I showed, protocore, is of proto-Earth. So the core of a proto-Earth, which is 3.8 to 3.5 billion years ago, this is the planet we are going to calling Proto-Earth. And the core that it has is Proto-Earth, uh, Proto-Core. Now, uh, today's core is compositionally expected to be different from that of the Proto-Core. Uh, so that's why, yeah. Okay. Compositionally and size difference. OK. Uh, now the next question is by Proshenjit Gorai. He is asking, which type of minerals are we referring, are we inferring to as pre-solar grains? Okay, good question. Um, so pre-solar grains can be, well, the thing I'm working, it's a good question actually. I am working with graphites, but pe there are a huge amounts, the most common, uh, most common pre-solar grain is silicon carbide. So as I see, it's a very highly resistant uh, grain. And so graphite, silicon carbides, nano diamonds, uh, so diamond particles as well, and uh, many others, but these are the major th three. But pre-solar grains can be uh, different forms. Yes. Okay. Juhi Sultana is asking, what about Planet Nine? Does it really exist? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Uh, so the next question is by Obiruk De. He is asking, what's the difference between astronomy and laboratory astrophysics? Ooh, so astronomy is um, making spectral observations um, of... So in astronomy, they do mathematical calculations and try to understand how things moved uh, in the universe and how they moved, where they have moved, where they can move. Uh, so it's mostly uh, a lot of dynamic studies, astronomy is. And laboratory astrophysics, it's like we are trying to study or understand each object in the universe, but instead of using spectral observations or sending out um, or doing rover observations, any kind of observations, instead of doing that, we are taking things from the space, making it into uh, uh, like a small particle, and not making it, but finding out the small particles and observing it through microscope. So using microscope instead of a telescope to understand the material. Okay, now the next question is again by Ubirup De. PM is a pollutant and toxic and a direct consequence of global warming. And it causes more lightning, giving us more ozone. But isn't that counterintuitive as global warming also depletes ozone? 
Yes, good question. It's, and that's um, when I read about it, it's like, yeah, ozone is good, but ozone, so ozone is getting depleted up in the stratosphere, but the amount of ozone in the troposphere is increasing. So remember, ozone in stratosphere, good. Um, uh, protects us from UV light. But when it's in our breathing zone, when it's around us, it's bad because it causes formaldehyde, goes into many side reactions, which causes chemicals that are not good for our health. Also not good for the um, plants and uh, things, etc. Yeah. Okay. Now, since you have also... Uh, mo bit experience in cosmochemistry so yeah, another question is coming that does the subject touch upon the origins of life it does actually um so i'm not an expert i'm very far away from biology actually but yes uh, my uh, so all these materials they also have so all the materials like meteorites and um, uh Stardust and stuff, they all, not stardust, but meteorites mostly, they come with a lot of volatiles in it. So volatiles means like um, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus. So all these are basic um, building blocks of life, right? So it is theorized. There is a theory how life eventually started to form. So Earth is actually very close to the sun. So when it was forming, when it was a violent, a lot of wind blowing from the uh, sun, there's a lot of um, impacts happening. So what happened is um, at that time, all the volatiles that was here towards the inner side of the solar system, they got blown away uh, because of all the winds and it was so hot. So there was nothing, it was just rocks. Now it is theorized, theorized that Eventually, when things come down and there were migrations again, particles from outside of the solar system, not outside, outside, but closer to the outside edge of the solar system, we still don't know actually where the solar system ends. So things from there, which were able to contain their volatile matters, they came and fall to the Earth. So that's how, probably, that's how life came to be. It's like it's supplied materials, yes. So yes, people do a lot of astrobiological study on this. I do not do it, but there are studies, yes. Okay. Now another guy, his name is uh, Kazi Roshan. He is asking that how can we go to the field of astrobiology through geology? Oh, uh, yeah, that's a good question. And so the thing is, when you do research, you First of all, uh, one thing I want to say is uh, no matter which field of science or engineering you are, you can go into any field, okay? It, you have a basic knowledge and that is important for other fields as well. So when we do planetary science, there's, there is engineers, people who make rockets, who do uh, who just build certain parts, maybe who, whoever in an... Um, whoever is making even like a camera. So you need someone, a camera person in a team because you want to take pictures, take good pictures of the planets and things that we are uh, sending our rovers to, right? For us, for geology, we, we, we do a lot of um, organic study. So when we do organic geochemistry or um, some people study trees, um, so you can go, just show your interest. If you are an undergrad, show your interest when you're trying to uh, apply to master's study, say, find a faculty who does um, research on biology or geobiology even. Uh, you go through that, you take one step at a time. You understand how life came into being, how rocks can store materials that contribute to life and then as you understand earth 
Earth is one of the planets, right? So this is our prototype. We do not understand anything out in the solar system before understanding Earth. So if you have knowledge about your Earth, you can always take that prototype, take your knowledge and put it on something else and understand it using Earth as a proxy. Yes, you can go from any field to any field. You just have to read things, listen to people talking and go approach that person. Yes. Okay. Now the next question is by Anvesha Nasrin. She is asking, does metallic hydrogen exist in Jupiter? Is it possible to make metallic hydrogen? Ooh, I, what is meant by metallic hydrogen? I, I do not know. I'm not a chemist. I really don't okay. know. So Anvesha Nasrin, can you just make your question a little bit more concerned? Means easier to understand. Now the next question is Dhanendra by Dhanendra Sarkar. His question is, is the speed of the expansion Kf the universe factor faster than the speed of light? Yeah, I've heard about it. This is a really astronomical question, guys. I do not know answers to. I'm not the person to ask this question to. But is it really? I do not know. But I have heard talk about it. So I don't know. Okay, now a lot of questions are coming, but before that, we should also actually know your experience in how you have joined the college. Which uh, why did you take research field as a means field to work? So can you just uh, tell something about it? Okay. Sure. Yeah. Well, okay. So I why I took research. Hmm. I was always been interested in research. Um, to be honest, I like science. That's why I came. So my family wanted me to be an engineer, but I revolted. I said, no, I'm going to study geology because, hey, I, I got in, if you go look at the Himalayas and like, they have such huge mountains. How did they form? And yes, so I was curious and curiosity drove me. Um, and I ended up in geology. Then um, I did my master's from IIT Bombay and um, everyone going, was going into the oil industry. I do not support fossil fuel. And also I, I was too naive at that time. Um, I did not get internship in fossil fuel industry. I got rejected from every um, personal interview rounds. So I was like, huh, they don't like me. I don't like them either. I will go into research. <laughs> And so, uh, and also my friends, uh, my, my closest friends were all going into research. So I was like, yes, this is where I want to go. I want to go to US, see the world and do my research. So this uh, little girl with a lot of dreams came to US. Uh, then I um, applied to seven universities and got accepted in only one of them, but a very nice uh, like a very good research institute called Scripps Institution of Oceanography in San Diego. It was beautiful, amazing atmosphere on the Pacific coast, amazing. But my advisor, so here, there I was doing research on high pressure temperature um, experimental petrology. So I was taking samples from Earth, subjecting it to high pressure temperature, which are proxies to high pressure temperature as you go down on the earth things get more pressurized and higher in temperature so i was trying to see how materials behave when you subduct it inside the earth so that was my research and i got interested so most planets do not have plate tectonics and it was mind-blowing to me i got interested in planetary science there but um, but i went there for a phd my advisor, uh, my lab was not good. And I went into serious mental health issues. One more thing. When, if you are a master's or a bachelor student wanting to do a research, always prioritize your advisor, how your advisor is, what that person works on rather than the university, okay? Um, I didn't know that I was too naive. And I just came there for the university and the big research is that too, but the quality of life was very low for me. So I ended up leaving my PhD and then I 
came to know about this program. So the program that I am currently in is an uh, interdisciplinary uh, multi-departmental program. So it's between physics, chemistry, um, environmental science, and geology departments. And uh, so I got interested. I was like, hey, I'm going to work with so many experts in different fields and get to see different perspectives. And then I saw my advisor's profile there, and she is amazing. She went to Antarctica to hunt for meteorites. Uh, she works in all these free solar grains, work with graphites, uh, do all this cool analysis. And man, going to Antarctica to hunt meteorites sounds super lucrative. Okay, I have really shallow reasons to why things I do. It's like going places is my one of the major things. Uh, so. Yeah, that's how I ended up with her. She's amazing. I love her. Um, and I ended up where I am. That's how, yes. So it's very nice to know that. Now, Uddipta Mohanto, he is asking, how we students of art sciences from India can pursue PhD from a good university in USA? What are the obstacles regarding it? And how can we overcome them? Okay. Um, so there are three questions. The first question is how we can go and get into good universities. There, so I thought about it. I thought there are three ways, major ways, about how um, a person from uh, India or any South Asian countries generally come to US. So the first and the most naive, not naive even, it's uh, most a taxing way is to uh, go and listen to talks of uh, professors, not go, but since everything is online now, read more papers, listen to talks of professors, um, go through their profiles, email them, maybe 50 emails per day, email them and see if they have vacancy or what they're doing currently, what research they're doing. That's one way so eventually you get to talking to them and you just push your head through the stream there's a second way where you can follow all the societies like agu or um, gsa uh, or egu even uh, all the societies um, look out for ads um, in all the groups look out for uh, ads so people post if someone gets a grant from somewhere, they post about their vacancy on um, social media platforms, Twitter. Twitter is another way. Uh, so these days, most, almost all faculties are trying to socialize and making make science cool. So they all have Twitter accounts where they post about their research and advertisement or whatever is going on in their life. So if you're interested in, um, or you're just trying to find things, so that is one thing. So this is called networking, my second point. Networking is important. So PhD is actually a job. It's, it's yes, you are getting a degree at the end of it, but consider it as a job. So looking for a job. Uh, you're looking for a job at an industry or at an academia. Same thing, you have to go out, network, put your words out that I want time to do a PhD, follow their term. So you follow people on LinkedIn, right? So for academia, uh, people there are a few people in LinkedIn as well in academia, but most people are on Twitter doing things. So go follow them. This is the second way. Third way is if you can get it through your uh, current advisor or if your current advisor is collaborating somewhere abroad. Okay, so you try and get into certain projects, do some part of it work here, and then there's like, familiarity that person knows you so like hey can you vouch for me or um i really liked your work so i want to continue working with you so that's the third way and probably the most easiest way but yeah so there are three ways i did the first way which now that i think was not the smartest way at all um so i think the second way is a good common ground because third way where you go through your advisor is kind of comes from where you are. Like no, not everyone gets that chance, but that's the best I think. Yeah. Okay. Now the second question which he asks is can a student from art sciences background study atmospheric sciences? 
I will answer that question. Okay. Um, but um, going back to the last question, there are two, uh, two other points in the last question that I didn't okay. answer. Yeah, sure. Um, what um, hardships? There are a lot of hardships uh, associated with First of all, um, cultural shocks. So we Indians talk and we have a different vision of life, which is different from things in the US. So you things like students here are more like forward. We are more uh, dependent on our professors, but here students are not that dependent. They do their independent studies. So I find the students here are very independent. So trying to uh, put ourselves in, like change our personality around it. Uh, that's a, a struggle that I had gone through. Uh, cult other cultural shocks, how things like we call our professors by your name, uh, by their name, which is like, oh, but that's not a big deal. Um, yeah, so cultural shocks is one thing. Coming here from a very um, codependent, interconnected society and starting to live on our own is another thing that is difficult, uh, very difficult. Uh, then you are like uprooting yourself from a society that you have lived all your life and then you are trying to make another life of your own. So these are going to be adult uh, friendships, different from the friendships that you currently have. Uh, like colleagues becoming your life. It is difficult. It's a lot of difficult. And once you come out of your country, you will uh, face imposter syndrome. Uh, different kinds of mental health issues. You probably will face discrimination based on if you are a woman. Uh, things are a lot sexist here. It's still very sexist in India, but here, yeah, the way is different. Uh, you also face racism. You can, not that everyone faces it, but these are still things. And yeah, but I, I can give a whole, I can talk about two hours for this. So just moving on. How can we get uh, what's the remedy or how can we deal with it is to talk about it, talk more about it, uh, listen to people talking about it, how they deal with it. And yes, so that has helped me. So there you go. Answer to all the three parts of your question. And um, OK, coming back to how a person from Earth science can go into atmospheric science. Yes. Uh, it's easy because atmosphere is part of the earth. Um, so if you are doing solid earth and so consists of the lithosphere, biosphere and the atmosphere. So as I said, you can go into from the lithosphere being a solid the earth geology to because they all interact, right? So the lithosphere interacts with the biosphere. The biosphere also interacts with the atmosphere. So there is a connection. So if you are trying to change your field, find that connection where they interact so once you find that connection you can either work on that connection level or you can start working on the connection level and then creep out to the other field so that, that's how i see it okay now the next question is by apurbo roy what are the what are the opportunities in cosmochemistry after msc geology or applied geology in india Ooh. Hmm. So in India, um, I thought about it. So in India, the National Oceanographic Institute, National Institution of Oceanography, uh, it's in Goa. So I know a professor, a faculty there, who, not that I know him, I know of him, that he does um, micrometeorite study. So he takes a ship, goes out in the ocean, dredge the ocean floor, and look for meteorites that might have fallen in the ocean. And she, he comes back and studies those things. So there is, uh, so this is one. Then PRL, Ahmedabad, it does a lot of uh, cosmological, uh, cosmochemistry work. They have a different instrument instruments for that. Then there is another private institute, this Amiti. I think uh, I'm meeting. It's in somewhere in Mumbai region. So they are doing uh, studies in Ladakh actually. So the taking Ladakh as a prototype for how Mars is. So they're studying geology of Ladakh to be to understand Mars. So uh, and it's actually an astro 
astrobiology focused institute so you can look it up these are the three main i know now yes so this is very interesting uh, now the next question is by shonok dotto can you share some advice on how to pursue a research career in cosmochemistry in the united states coming from a geoscience background how to that's it's a very broad and open ended question i think how to pursue or so first of all for pursuing you have to find an advisor uh, and as i said there are many ways to find an advisor um also keep looking for their talks um they share their current uh, research that's going on and uh, also they talk about whether they want to collaborate or whether they want someone so fun fact it's like my advisor has started working with me but she depends on my geological background knowledge in order to understand some of the works that she is doing because she is not a geologist by training so she does not understand all the minerals and uh, the geology aspect of it so there come my expertise so i am as a phd student you also contribute to the you have your own expertise you have your own knowledge and you are valuable on itself so you are contributing to science um so yes another thing don't let on anyone treat you otherwise you are making science you are contributing to science so you yes uh so that's that's one thing um yeah networking is super important keeping yourself up to date to the whatever is happening in the field so uh, subscribe to newsletters science newsletters uh, um, go to talks always be updated uh, attend conferences it's harder i think in india because the amount of registration fee is so high but these days many of the youtube as you guys are doing a youtube live uh, many universities the big universities they also do youtube talks and they even if they are departmental seminars they take a video and upload it on youtube so find them many of the museums give um, talks yeah and if you mean like what opportunities you have after doing a cosmochemistry so first of all cosmochemists use a lot of instruments so you can get a job as a instrument technician second of all you can also get uh, yourself as a project scientist in any of the space agencies or you can continue doing research uh there are many yeah okay now the next question is by partho ghosh is there any present research being done on establishing self sustaining ecosystems on another planet there are actually um i do not remember the name of the people but yes there are uh, so elon musk is doing some on it on his own um but yeah but other people are also doing it uh, not on the line of nuking other planet to make an atmosphere but people are trying to make it more sustainable i don't think nuking nuking a planet is going to create anything sustainable at least on a long time scale okay now next question is by onik mondol didi could you please put more emphasis on the importance of interdisciplinary research by a, be it any field oh okay more emphasis okay so i am an inter, i consider myself an interdisciplinary scientist but uh so okay one thing there is a back like a negative point of an interdisciplinary i i'm going to say that first first uh, so no one takes you seriously because not no one but most people don't take you seriously especially the classical people if you are not i am doing research in cosmochemistry and astrophysics i am in the physics department i am being um, underestimated all the time by my physics colleagues because i don't have a degree in physics but experience wise knowledge wise i understand enough physics to do 
my research in, right? I, of course, I don't know quantum physics to go with and do string theory, but I understand dynamics. I understand kinematics, understand thermodynamics. So yes, I do understand that. So you will con constantly uh, be underestimated. And um, now, actually, it's a good point. Now, most of departments are trying to make their department more inclusive and um, interdisciplinary. So more jobs are opening up where people from, they're just not looking at surgeologists. They are also looking at someone who can work on say geomorphology, or if even if you're doing geology on just earth, they are looking for someone who can also look at the geology of Mars say. So, so that requires to because, but, or to geology of uh, Pluto. So recently I learned that Pluto's surface is all ice, not just any ice, it's nitrogen ice, okay? So it's solid nitrogen. Now ice, like imagine all the rocks of our planet being replaced by ice, but all the ice also forming mountains and rivers and um, valleys. So since it's a different material, it works on a completely different principle. The pressure, the atmospheric pressure is less. Um, rainfall is happening at a different scale. So things like this. So you cannot put your rocks on other planets. So you have to understand how other planets or the other parts of the solar system works in order to infer the geology of there. So here you see there are like different, let's say, different knowledge that you need. Uh, also, being an interdisciplinary scientist, you get to know so much. So you are working in this uh, zone where there are many things getting intertangled. So you have an understanding of every field, engineering, uh, basic understanding, not that you're an expert in everything, but you understand how things, different components of a thing come together and form a complete aspect. So, yeah, it's like understanding anything you need to look at from different directions. You cannot be working just as an atmospheric chemist. You have to understand the dynamics that the convection that goes in the atmosphere. So there comes the physics of it. You have to understand the uh, organic particles and how bio system reacts with it, how much it gives out, how much it takes in, so how plants react. So. Everything is interconnected, and I love being in an interdisciplinary field. So, yeah, all go for it. Okay, sure. Now, the next question is by Ubhirup De. Do you think we are alone in this universe? Just asking, since we are made of substances that are readily available. Hydrogen is the most abundant element, oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon just need a few fusion steps. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so we, there are so many planetary bodies in our galaxies and the probability of finding life in any one of them is given that so much numbers, it's high. Okay. It's, it's not impossible to find life in other planets in the galaxy or in the universe. Um, so for life to sustain, it needs to have a continual source of energy. The system needs to be stable for some time. It's not just the basic components of life being available, the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur, but also there has to be a continual sustainable source of energy, also a stable atmosphere and uh, like a source and a sink of energy. So all those components coming together makes life sustainable in any object. It, there are many planets in the solar system, not solar system, but in the universe that uh, theoretically things are possible there, but we have, we are yet to see um, proof of that. But yes, if you ask me if it's possible, I think it is. Okay, now Shoham Kapuria is asking, what is geomorphology? Is structural geology same as geomorphology? Uh, similar but not same. Uh, geomorphology is study of the morphs. So how things look, how the shape looks, how, how, why is the slope like this and not like this? 
um, what made this look like this and not like this. Uh, yeah, so it's it's study about um, how things look and why it looks like that. Okay. Now the next question is again by Abhi uh, Obirubde, and it's since the tectonic plates are always shifting, how long before some continent splits up? <laughs> uh, uh, before it splits up, but it takes uh, two hundred ish million years for uh, a continental cycle to happen. So um, some of them are. Uh, it's like um what's it called i forgot the name in africa uh the rift it's it's splitting up so it might split before the other continents do so yes learn about wilson cycle it will help you understand more okay <laughs> uh wilson cycle okay <laughs> <laughs> now, a question by Partho Ghosh. The present target to send humans to Mars is before 2030. Do you think the existing rate of technological advancement will be able to achieve that? I think so. Yes, we are pretty advanced. Like, we, yeah. So that's the thing. We have technology about everything. Um, tra trajectory to that is uh, our energy crisis. So oil and gas, not sustainable. Um, very bad for the atmosphere. Very bad for sustaining human life on the planet. Uh, what we can do, we can do renewable resources. So sun, water, wind. We have technology for all of it. But we are not doing it because money. So money is the only thing uh, holding us back. But since countries are somehow very, it's like their flex is putting th things and people on planets, right? So this is a flex in every, like Russia, Russia does it. So why did um, America put uh, uh, people on the moon? Why did, uh, why are we doing all this? Yes, scientific curiosity is a thing, but flex, Ge geopolitical problems, geopolitical um, you. Um, so there's a lot of money in space science <laughs> because it, that's where most of your, um, I guess, confidence, or what's called pride, pride. Um, you feel accomplished if you as a country have done something. So yes, it is possible actually. Um, so many things are possible, but there is not enough uh, financial incentive to get it. So. Okay. Now the next question is by Anvesha Nasrin. You are amazing, Didi. Yeah, actually, you are amazing. <laughs> now the question goes, do you have any advice for first year students who want to take up research in future? Um, okay. If you are sure that you want to take research, um, side note on that, if you... So going into a PhD field or a research field is hard, okay? It is really hard. It, like research is not what people show in TVs or in documentaries. It's not all flowery. It is really hard. It's very frustrating. And there is one Eureka, not Eureka even, there's one moment is like, okay, this works. But you spend the rest six days not working, banging your head against the wall. So research is hard. So if you are not, if you do not like research or PhD, do not take it as a, like you can take it, but it's not advisable from my own experience that if you're not getting a job, falling back on PhD is, is not going to make your life any easier, at least in my experience. So you will end up getting frustrated because research pays bad, okay? It does not pay as much as you get in industry. So that compensation needs to be done if, you think your life is worth living. So make sure um, also, okay, so answer your question, what advice do you have is to read more, to see what your peers are doing, what how the research is going in your field. Mm. One thing that happens is when we are doing research, we get so much into our own work, we lose the sight of the big picture. So what we are actually trying to accomplish. And so, Attending um, talks, conferences, talking with your peers about your science will help you keep motivated 
as well as you will get different ideas and it will keep you on track. So this is one advice I have. Okay, so thank you so much, Didi. Now, uh, we just want to ask that, can you share the experience of your college life or university life? How was it? Oh, uh, it was amazing. Uh, yeah, the food for favorite time. Oh my God. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> no, it's, you will never get this Yadufu life back. Enjoy as much as you can. I'm sorry you had to go through this lockdown yes. in this time. Yes. Uh, so, but whatever time you get, make the most amount of it. So the friends you make in college, in your work life, you might be lucky and get good friends. I, I have been really lucky. I have amazing friends from my work colleagues, but uh, friends you get in colleges, you mix a very different kind of bonds with them. Uh, participate in things. And as this JUSC team is doing, your guys are doing an amazing job, actually. Uh, this is very important for your career. Not only is it, like, don't take career as a different thing from your life. They are intertangled. So career is a part of your life, okay? Um, so it... Participating in extracurricular activities is important. I cannot stress this enough. Every time I talk to any of my juniors, I say, go do things. It will help you develop your personality. It will help you. So if, say you, you just want a job. You just want to do research. But as I said, networking is important to navigate your world, right? So doing extracurricular work help you develop that communication skill. You get trained to pick up signals, to understand whether you are a follower or a leader. Both are equally important in a group, okay? Uh, find joys in things. Um, another thing in selecting your career, there are a lot of options. Like nowadays, it's not just engineering, doctor, lawyer, scientist. There are a lot of intertangled fields. You can also get a job writing about other people's science because scientific papers are hard to read, okay? To be honest, as an undergrad or a master's student still, I, I had a hard time reading scientific papers. So there are people who take those scientific papers and write it for the general audience. You can even write a book out of it. So you can make a career out of that. Or these days, science communication is getting more and more interested in. So you see there is a discrepancy, right? People are not taking vaccines. They're saying that government is putting microchips in our body or it might not be safe because there is a huge discrepancy from what the scientists are actually doing and what the general audience is getting. So the information. So science communication is important, especially in this time when we are trying to man navigate towards a greener energy uh, we have to, as a citizens, try to maneuver our government towards investing in greener um, technologies, right? So this communication is important. And many people are trained for this. You receive training for this. Um, uh, as, so this is another option. What else? I got lost in thought. What I was saying? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> you... Uh, uh, yeah. you need to, um, <laughs> so this is the thing, it's talking to people, um, uh, building group, building, a, uh, taking the initiative. So whoever you guys are taking an initiative to do something, to help your things, uh, to help your peers, right? Uh, we didn't have this and I am glad that you are doing it. It's, like, it's very helpful for people, I, I think. Um, and, uh, yeah, so this also looks very good on your CVs. People actually say, okay, this person did this. It's like, oh, she is she or he is not just um, or a non-binary person, she, he, or they. They are not just um, tunnel vision. It helps you open up. It gives you meaning to whatever you are doing. Uh, yeah, so whenever you're doing something, if you are in a, in a team doing something and recognize that what, what work is giving you the most joy? Is it is it doing the um, budget, or is contacting people giving you joy, or asking questions, or hosting as Pramona is doing right now? Is that giving her the most joy? 
It's the question that she can ask herself, right? I'm uh, sorry for putting you in spot. But no, no, it's okay. <laughs> uh, so if you identify the aspect, even as a as a student or a, like if you are doing a small project, like what aspect of that work is giving you joy? Is working with the small minute uh, particles giving you joy or coding on a computer? So that way you can say, okay, I want to go into the numerical modeling field and not on laboratory field. Or do you like going out in field and doing field works, bringing back samples? So that way it will also help you delineate what you want to do in your life. Yeah. So there's another question by Partho Ghosh. He's asking which theory has more geological proof, pseudopanspermia, angiogenesis, or biogenesis? Uh, for for life, it means uh, I I don't understand the question. Um, can you please explain? I don't understand the terms. I don't know the terms that you said. Okay, so uh, Partho Ghosh, can you be a little more specific about your question? Okay, and now there is another question which is going again by Abhirup De. This is a question very specific to the Indian society. There is a societal pressure to settle down. Is there any settling down as a researcher? As you said, research is frustrating. Rewards take a longer time to come in compared to jobs. Yeah, that is a pressure. I would be, yes, it is a big pressure, I think. Yeah, as an academia a person, you are never settled down. You get even after PhD, you get a postdoc for one or two years. Then you go to another postdoc, one or two years. Then you don't really know where you're going with it. It's harder to settle down, have your own family even to marry uh, or to take care of your parents. You have like, you are staying away from everyone you love. It's actually quite frustrating, honestly. I'm not advertising <laughs> academia to anyone right now. But, uh, how to navigate it? I do not know the answer to that, dear. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yes, either you revolt, either you revolt from your family, say, hey, I want to do this, I'm not going to marry. Or, yeah, or find someone that is also in the research field, so you can go off doing your own research and have this happy, independent couple. <laughs> Okay, so yeah. that was quite informative. <laughs> now, uh, now, uh, so actually, we are in the uh, to, towards the end of the session. So for that, uh, it was really very happening to talk to you, and thank you so much for your valuable time. So, Didi, can you please tell something about today's experience of yours with Jadavpur University Science Club? Hey, I had a lot of fun. This is fun, hey, guys. Like whoever is listening now, or you guys, like this is Sunday evening, you came out and there's two festivals going, both, one of all, and there is Holi, and you're still here, man. <laughs> oh my God. Who, who is going to be successful? Like I would never do this when I was in my undergrad. So you guys don't worry about your career. I'm sure you're going to be successful. And I actually enjoyed it. So I woke up early. Um, yes, I woke up early for you guys, and I'm glad I did. I like talking to all of you, and I'm very thankful and honored. And yes, I'm very flattered, you guys. You're so nice, and this is fun. <laughs> so actually, we played with the colors of science in today in today's session. It was only <laughs> another way. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. Um, yeah, I think it's. I think science is quite colorful. Yeah, yes. whenever it gets back black and white, go out and do something else. It will fill out with colors again. <laughs> okay. So thank you so much, Didi, for your precious time and your pulse of wisdom. I'm sure it's going to inspire and aspire us in many ways. So thank you for that. And we were we are towards the end of the session. We hope that I have to say. Sorry, yeah, yeah, sure. uh, oh, oh, so there were a few questions that I didn't understand. Um so if you Whoever it is, if you want to send an elaborate, like elaborate on the question, um, or if anyone else wants to contact me, you have my email ID. I put it down in the slides. If not, I can um, 
can I, yeah, I can put it in the chat, I guess. Yes, sure. Um, also, plug in. I, so, as you know, I, I suffered from a lot of academia related mental health problems. So, guys, take care of your mental health, okay? Yes, do that. Um, and there is a lot of pressure from everyone around us, from our peers, from our parents, from our families, societies, everywhere. Take care of your mental health. No one understands you as much as you do. So listen to what your body is saying. Listen to whenever you're, you're, think, you're thinking as like, this is, this is not how should I, should, things should be. So whenever you feel something, be vocal, talk about it. And um, so based on that, I, I am trying to be more vocal about my PhD life. And I have a, uh, what is it called? An Instagram page where I try to post about my work life. Not that my I have a, another life, but that's all I, my life is. But <laughs> I generally post about what I'm doing today just stories about things so if you're interested to see and, and and not just me actually there are many people out there who in twitter and on instagram who post about their phd life so if you're interested and curious about how things are go follow them um um because i think that i didn't know how things look like until i came to this field so it would be nice as uh, someone who is starting out or is trying to see navigate whether they want to go. So do that. Um, another thing is what I wanted to say. I forgot. I keep forgetting about things I want to. Oh, oh, another just parting thing uh, I thought I would say, but now I forgot. Um, ask for help. So um, as an Indian society, we do not ask for help. We consider asking for help um, or struggling with something as a failure. Um, so don't. Um, so whenever you want to know something or say like, "Oh, this is cool. I wonder if this would be fine for me to do it. Can I do this?" That's your asking, right? So ask for it. Go, go, go. Time like write an email or call that person and say, "Hey, I listened to this. I'm interested in. It. Can I? Is there any way I can get involved?" But don't just ask that I want to do. Just say that you have done your background work as well. Just don't ask, like, can you help me? Don't do that. But ask for help. Show them that you are motivated, you are interested, and yes. So, yeah, that was my parting. <laughs> Thank you so much, Didi. Okay, so for those, uh, I'm just reading again the of, uh, mail ID of Ishita D. It's uh, Pal Ishita one at the rate gmail.com and did your instagram handle you didn't tell the name oh, oh um wait, wait. not that there is a lot of post okay don't expect much so what do you think oh okay so it's called phd itesh okay so it's phd underscore it underscore ish so thank you so much, Didi, once again. And also thank you to our beloved audience who was so patient and who gave us some interesting questions to be answered. And to be sun, like getting enriched scientifically in this way, then do follow our Facebook page again. It's uh, Jadavpur University Science Club, JUSC. And the Instagram handle goes as JUSC underscore official. And also we do publish some scientific articles at Mute. You can find that at the official website of Jadavpur University Science Club. So we are calling it a day, Didi. Thank you so much. Thank you so Thank much for the audience. It was very happy to, like, I am very happy to be a part of it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bye, Didi. Bye, guys. Bye. Love yourself. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank Bye. you.